Welcome to 032 Conversations, the podcast where we talk to creatives, see how they live, and how they do their work. I'm your host, Carlo Villarica. Alright, this is the Ask Me Anything episode. This is the second this is the second time we've done this. The first one, I'm gonna link it in the show notes. We had a whole bunch of questions and I thought it was really fun and it seemed to get pretty okay download, so maybe so that that was I'm thinking maybe it's a maybe it'd be a good idea to do it again. But really the main reason why I'm doing the Ask Me Anything episodes are number one, it's good to experiment with different formats. I wanna see if a different format would be good, something different from the usual interview that we do with some with a creative. And also, the truth is, there's also LibSynth, which is our host. It's where we upload all of our podcasts. We have some limitations. Like, I don't have the unlimited... Like, I pay a monthly fee for this. And then the... And then the uh, the, the bracket that I paid for only has, like, 250 megabytes of storage every month. So... Every time I, up, I upload a podcast, especially the long one, sometimes they're 60, 70 megabytes. And on most months, that's fine. So in October, there's five Tuesdays in, instead of four, and that means I need, to sh- I need to post five episodes. And if I post five long episodes, that means my storage usage in Libsyn, which is where I host the podcast, that means it's going to get full. And then that means that Libsyn is going to charge me a little extra. So that means I need to include a short episode every now and then. But, you know, it's a good excuse to uh, try different things. So I'm recording this on a bright Sunday morning. Actually, we have my family. We They're all getting ready because we have to leave for mass and eventually we're going to have lunch. But I'm... I, f- I finished the head beside number one, I have to record this. Number two, I've been up since like five, took a nice little bike ride up a mountain. It was a nice excuse to get out of the city. I felt like I was traveling a little bit, but wow, like I was struggling up that mountain on a bike. And there were so many instances when I felt, when I just felt like I was going to just give up and stop. And then I just kept looking in front of me and I kept thinking, just keep going, just push, just push, just push. Just I I, 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 I realized a little trick. I, I don't look too far up the mountain, too far ahead, because then I get discouraged by how much more uphill climb I have to go to. So what I would do is I just look at the road right in front of me and then keep thinking that I just need to get to that road and I just focus on the pedals push left push right push left here in Cebu there's a a lot of like people like to bike up Busai so a lot of cyclists bike all the way up and there's a spot called Willys where there's a lot of cyclists and then right after Willys there's that you know where you take that left turn going up tops there's like a little bar place there near Latte Gola has a really good view of the city so my goal today was to hit that spot and then when I did it it felt really good I took a picture because you know that's what you do and and it was really nice to get up there it's like I traveled to a different you know it's like I was out of Cebu for a few minutes but you know what you don't always need to get on a bike and torture yourself up or suffer yourself up a mountain you can always call destination specialists you know with destination specialists you can take a trip anywhere in the world just call them you can get a ticket book a package there's a lot of these like really cool cruises now that you can go to so just visit them they have branches uh, they have two branches here in Cebu in the upper ground level of SM City Cebu, and the second level in Vanilla Town Center. Destination specialists. I've never booked 
a ticket in my life. All I do is I call destination specialists. I ask them what's the most convenient fare at the cheapest price. And they handle all of the thinking for me. And in fact, anytime we go out of the country, we always check destination specialists for their packages. You know, it's a really good way to have a holiday. Take a trip with destination specialists. Before we get to the podcast, if you haven't yet, subscribe to 032 Conversations. We release a new episode every Tuesday. And if you if you enjoy this Ask Me Anything episode, and you know, for whatever reason you wanna hear more from me, I publish a Monday Musings newsletter every Monday. Uh, and then you can just go to 032.com slash Monday. It'll show you a little example of what I published. This was published like years ago. But it'll show you an example. And all you have to do is subscribe. And every Monday you'll get an email from me. Okay, let's get to the questions. First question. Hey, Carlo. Awesome stuff. I'm not kissing ass when I say I anticipate your emails every Monday. She's talking about Monday Musings. It's a newsletter that comes out every Monday morning. You can subscribe to it. I have a question for you. I watched the video you linked with Gary V in it. And he mentioned audio is a huge opportunity. You've been podcasting for a while now. So based on your experience, do you think that what he's saying applies to the Philippine business landscape? Thanks, Abby. This question was emailed. Uh, she replied to the Monday Musings, Monday Musings newsletter. Uh, she's also referring to this video, which I'll link in the show notes. It's uh, when Gary V was here in the Philippines. Gary V, not Gary V the singer, Gary Vaynerchuk. So I'm. Um, some of you may already follow him. He has a huge following all over the world, particularly in the Philippines. I've seen more and more people post about him. And so he was here in Manila. And he did this whole this whole talk, and a lot of it was about parenting, self awareness, the whole his he has a spiel basically, but he does talk about the importance of audio moving forward. And you know, if you're a content creator, it might be a good idea to start a podcast. If you're an app developer, it might be a good idea to start looking into. Uh, I don't know what is it that Google or that that Amazon uh, speaker that you can talk to. You can make apps for those things. So he thinks we're about there, and it's it's still really early, but um, he thinks that that's the next big thing. So that's what the question is referring to. So based on my experience, do you think that what he's saying applies to the Philippine business landscape? So first of all, I don't think I've been podcasting for that long, honestly. Like I've been po- podcasting since Feb 2018. I've only released about 30 plus episodes and there are a lot more uh, podcasts who've been going at it much longer, if not locally but in the US and you know they they can tell you that maybe in the first year or two or three nothing happened so i don't really expect anything to happen right away if anything does but that doesn't mean i'm not going to stop looking for ways to keep this sustainable so have i earned money from the podcast yes i have actually a few episodes back uh we were sponsored by wealth bank and uh, Toyota Team Cebu, they sponsored two episodes for an event that they were doing. But do I expect that to happen on the regular? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if this will come out in this episode or in the next one, but we will have sponsors in the podcast. Now, we will see if this is a sustainable way to... For the podcast to make money, we I don't know yet. Is there going to be a return right away in the next year or two? I don't really know. But just to give you guys some context, when we started blogging, when we started 032, it started off as a blog. We were posting about restaurants, featuring uh, creatives, look, posting travel places, writing about travel places, posting photos, and... 
we when we started it in 2011 take note that's 7 years ago we didn't know if there was going to be any return so fast forward to now and 032 is one of my main ways that I make money like I have a salary from 032 I give myself a salary and that was not directly because of blogging it's because of the attention that we got through the blog, through 032.com, which we, which I might get into more in a future question. So in the future question, in a question down the line, there's somebody asking about our, like, how, when did we become profitable or something like that. But anyway, when we first started, we thought we would sell advertising and it became clear really quickly that your website had to have because back then in 2011, there was no such thing as a sponsored post. Uh, hardly anybody was on Facebook or there was no Instagram or there was, but no one was, it wasn't that widespread yet. And then there were no influencers. Nobody was paying for sponsored posts. And then we were just looking at like banner ads. And then it, it became clear that we needed like traffic in the millions to have, uh, to make it worthwhile for advertisers. Because number one, if you're gonna get an advertiser, it's not because it's not it's not you're not just putting your hand out and getting a check. You have to give results at the time. Now, personally, I feel like the podcast is a really good way to advertise, and then that's what I'm going to be pitching to companies. But at the time, just putting up a banner ad on your website did not seem like a good way for companies to spend money. And if I couldn't, if I couldn't sell myself on that idea, it was going to be very difficult to sell that idea to other people. Advertising was out of the question when we first started. We started creating merchandise, which was really good. We still do that now. It's still a big part of what we are. It's a way for the brand to get its uh, to get its name across. It's a way for people to support what we do. It, but it only really accounts for about twenty to thirty percent of our uh, revenue. The main way we get revenue is through client work. It's stuff that you don't see in the blog or on social media. We provide uh, social media content for companies. And how we got contacts to this to these companies is through the 032 blog. Like they they knew about 032, they knew what we were doing, and they had the confidence to give us work essentially. And for the most part, that's how we even until now I think that's how we still get new clients every now and then. I mean, it it sounds like. I'm just saying this in a span of a few minutes, but really that whole process took years. So from 2011 to now, 2018, I think we only started doing client work two or three years ago. That, With that in mind, that's what I'm doing with the podcast. So I'm starting it. I'm not really sure if there's going to be any returns right away. In fact, I started the podcast because... I thought it was fun. Uh, I It seemed that the interviewees enjoyed it. And the people who do listen, they seem to enjoy it too. This is based on the the many uh, uh, screen grabs that I, that I, that get sent to me on Instagram or people sharing it on Facebook. And so it, it seems to be making an impact. And, that's what's important to me right now for the podcast. That's what's important, period. But in terms of impact also, in many ways, Cebu, maybe even the Philippines, is still catching up in for podcasts. So let's talk about Philippine business landscape. For me, in terms of business, I can't really say. Maybe we'll find out in the next few months if uh, more and more advertisers start coming in. Then, then I guess it's ready. But uh, if not, we're still going to continue doing this and still figuring out ways to make it worthwhile. But in terms of listenership, Cebu in the Philippines is slowly catching up to podcasts. There's definitely people learning about it. In fact, I think in 2018 alone, there were 
two or three uh, local podcasts that have been churning out, newer-ish podcasts that have been churning out com- content on a regular basis. So, But it's not at the level of US or Europe. So like in the US or Europe, if you're a pretty popular podcast, you're getting downloads in the thousands, right? In the tens of thousands. I've been getting a few hundred downloads per episode. But one thing I do notice is that people who enjoy the podcast really listen and make an effort to share it with other people. Almost every time we have a new podcast on Tuesdays, it gets multiple shares on Facebook. I mean, we'll get tagged every now and then on Instagram or Twitter. And and also, I notice the nice thing is these podcasts, they just stay there. And a lot of people who just discover the podcast, they'll discover the podcast on a new episode. And they'll be like, you know what? That was fun. And they start listening to the previous podcasts. So sometimes somebody will uh, tweet us an episode that's, I don't know, maybe two months old or something. Like, I have a friend. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kalu Corazo, my first, uh, my very, very first guest in the very first episode. Like, he tweeted two or three months after the Vincent Echo <laughs> uh, episode came out that he's been listening to it. And he and he can't believe I haven't seen the movie once. There's a movie called Once that we discuss in the Vincent Echo episode. And he's, like, seen it, like, three to four times or something. So... At first, I didn't even know what he was talking about. Then I realized, oh, yeah, we talked about that movie. And then this kind of impact, I just haven't seen it towards the tail end of my blogging days. Like towards 2015, 16, 17, it, uh, the, the, the blogging, just posting blogs up on the website didn't seem to have the same impact us the podcast there was not as much engagement in a sense that we didn't hear from the people who would read it sometimes they would still get uh, a lot of readers thousands and thousands of readers but it's really different if you hear from these people and and believe me i've heard from people who listen to the podcast like there was a recent event in uh, the pop district bazaar so zero three two, we sold some merchandise there. So I was walking the the bazaar a little bit. A few people uh, went up to me and they told me that they listened to the podcast. It's honestly really cool. It's really cool to hear that. Yeah, maybe even if they just listen to one episode or they binge listen to all of them, either way, the impact is there. So what do I see in the future for my podcast? Well, I'm already doing what I want with it. I'm I I I'm interviewing really interesting people and I think I'm certain that in my own way I'm contributing to the creative community. For the future of podcasts here in the Philippines, I'm not sure. I I don't really know. I I still seem to be having a con- the conversation of like how to listen to podcasts. More people seem to be asking me about it. But hopefully in the future, it will be a good way to make decent income. You know, it would like my dream for the podcast would be making income directly from the podcast, that directly either from the people who listen to it. We also have a Patreon. So you can subscribe through the Patreon and people can directly support the podcast. Or through advertising, which allows me to partner with cool companies. Of course, we're not getting just anybody to advertise. So whether it be through Patreon subscribers or through advertisers, uh, hopefully we get income directly from the podcast in that way. Next question is from Instagram at Iara Erica. How does... Someone from outside Cebu support the Cebu art scene. So I've been thinking about this a little bit. So a lot of the... When we say... I'm going to generalize in a really big way. So Cebu art scene will include musicians, artists, uh, basically creatives. It's going to be the same way how I describe creatives. Basically people creating something out of nothing. Artists or creatives, first of all, 
need to make an effort by putting themselves in a situation to succeed and allowing people to support them somehow. So you can see this with the, with the local musicians, for example. You know, one way to support local musicians is just to play their music on Spotify or share their music to your friends if you're outside Cebu. A lot of these musicians and artists actually do get some revenue from Spotify plays. Like, although it's really, really small, but over time, it does add up. And if you help spread the word, that spreads their art. Okay, same thing with... Uh, with illustrators, painters. If you just spread their word, a lot of their art is online and you can just spread it. So that's the easiest way to support the Cebu art scene. Now, there are artists who, who make their work accessible from others from outside Cebu. So for example, I recently talked to Kat Laino. Her episode isn't out yet, but she has a Patreon account. And her Patreon account, if you're not familiar with Patreon, Patreon allows fans to support artists or content creators like Kat Lino. Her Patreon account has like a hundred subscribers. And that's one of the biggest ways that she actually makes a living. Right? So uh, these are people who like her work, who are fans of her work. And I'm guessing a good number of them are outside of Cebu. So Patreon is a really good way to do that. Like same with this podcast. Like we have a Patreon account. Uh, if, you have, if you want to support 032 Conversations, Patreon, patreon.com slash 032. Some artists or creatives have put themselves in a situation so that they could succeed by allowing people who like their art to support them and the really good ones in my opinion have put themselves in a situation that allows people to monetarily support them even if they don't have stuff like patreon like recently happy garage they and if you listen to the happy garage interview mark deutsch talked about like their next step for happy garage which is like to make uh these toys or figurines uh, a few weeks ago, he he put out like a little shout out on uh, Instagram, like they wanted to make toys and they were up for commissions. And a lot of times, even if you're not from Cebu, you can have those things made. You it's very easy to send them cash, send them money, and then they can make it and they can deliver it to you. So there are there are plenty of ways for things like that. You know, it's more than just consuming their media, consuming their content, or sharing their content, which are, by the way, huge, huge ways to to help these artists and creatives as well. Like, I remember when I was in Spain, I spent a lot of time listening to music, and I, I listened to a lot of urban dub, and... And I shared it to my American friends. We would play Urban Dub while we were playing poker in the middle of the night. And they thought it was cool. But little things like that, that's one way to support the Cebu art scene. But, you know, for me, the best way is if you can find a way to monetarily support, order something, buy something. If there's a musician that you like, see if there's a way that you can get a shirt from them. Some of them are selling mer merchandise, like Mandawi Knights sells merchandise. You might have to send them a message. There are ways to do so that you know they can monetarily gain. So the next question is from Luis Stefan Enario. And he asks, wanted to submit a question para sa AMA. Listen to the last one and the topic of making 032 profitable struck a chord with me. So I wanted to find out how long it took between the inception of the company as a blog to consistently making a profit. I think this is useful for people who want to start something but are not really warned about how long it really takes between inception and profit. Also, there was a book you mentioned that changed your mindset about how expenses and accounting ought to be done in your business. Did you have an did did that have an immediate effect as soon as you applied the lessons you found in the book to your business or did it take a while for it to take hold? 
So the book he's referring to is uh, Profit First by... Let me check. I always blank on the name of the author. Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. I'm going to include a link to his book in the show notes as well. So I think I started Profit First in 2016. But let's get to the first question. So... I wanted to find out how long it took between the inception of the company to consistently making a profit. Okay, th- this is a bit of a tricky question because I think he, when he's when he's talking about making a profit, when he's talking about businesses, I suspect he's talking about more of a traditional business where you put capital in, you put money in, and then you run it, and then at some point you get your ROI, and then you get a profit. Now, 032 started very differently. We put basically zero pesos in, like a few thousand pesos to make the website. But really, in all honesty, we, it was basically nothing. It may be 20,000 pesos. So that, in terms of capital, really that's not much. So you could say that 032 started basically with without, we didn't, we didn't, really shell out that much money. So in that sense, if you look at the definition of profitable, as soon as we made more than 20,000 pesos, we were profitable. So maybe we've been profitable, I don't know, after four months because we got like a, we got like a little consultancy gig that paid basically 20,000 pesos after a few months of running, uh, Zero three two. So that's why this question is a little bit tricky. In uh, we're we're not a traditional business in a sense because when we created zero three two, it was really a lot of just blood, sweat, and tears. You know, there was no money put in. We didn't hire anybody. No one was getting paid a salary, and we didn't really know what we were doing. We just made a blog. Notice that it was getting a lot of traffic. And then after a few months, we were wondering, like, how do we make this go? How do we keep this going? How do we make this worthwhile? And that meant it should somehow sustain itself and make it worthwhile for us or for me to make money. I, I'd like to reframe this question a little bit because when we started 032, I wouldn't really consider it a real business off the bat. When we started 032, it was like a fun thing to do that we were putting a lot of our extra time and effort in. And then we tried a lot of things to make 032 a quote-unquote real business. In the beginning, once we noticed that it was getting a lot of traffic, we thought about selling advertising. And we kind of did. We Well, we, we thought about selling advertising we looked at banner ads and then we realized that the rates that the banner ads were like the rates that were being like some somebody sent us a file showing how much companies were charging for banner ads and it became really clear that in order for us to make any real money with banner ads we needed to get like traffic in the millions which was not happening we were not getting traffic in the millions we were getting traffic in the thousands so banner ads was out of the question. Uh, somewhere along the way, we we discovered that we could actually charge companies for like online contests. So we'd partner with a company, and then we'd raffle out something that they were that they wanted to give away, and we would charge for that. So in a way, we were able to charge for ads that way in the beginning, but it really didn't amount to all that much. And then we put up Google AdSense, and then, you know, that's hardly anything at all. We weren't getting much money from advertising in the beginning. So we, we decided we really were, I think I've said the story, well, this part of the story before, but so we were wondering what else to do. And then there was a writer, he came up to me and he wanted to write about Nick Automatic. And at that point, I had no, I had no idea who Nick Automatic was. Uh, I did a quick Google search. I was like, oh, okay, he owns a shirt brand. Cool. Um, well, yeah, I write about him. So he wrote about him. We he interviewed him, and we published it on our website. And then when we published it, 
our traffic spiked. So whenever our traffic spikes, it it you know catches my attention. I was like, who is this Nick Automatic guy? So we realized that at the time this must have been 2012 or something. I'm not sure. Uh, at the time, we 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 were just publishing blog posts, trying to sell advertising. And then we realized after the Nick Automatic post was that there was this huge T-shirt culture in Cebu, like like these kids from from the colleges were buying all of these local tees with like big graphics in the front, like big graphic tees, and it was huge. So we looked into it, and uh, I'd like I always credit uh, McCoy Rosales and Doyle C for for being super helpful to us when we asked them all sorts of questions about how to make t-shirts what was the business like what was the culture like and then they were really helpful and then so we started making t-shirts i think in 2012 but we were we didn't really get into it like we made like a batch of 30 sold those made another batch sold those we didn't give it an honest to goodness push until about 2013 let me look yeah, so in 2013, we we decided to get serious on, uh, well, I decided to get serious in 032 Clothing and see if we could consistently come out with new clothing every month. And then fortunately at this point, I met Jake, well, I, I, mean, I knew Jake Meningo since, I don't know, college or something, but we, I, I got him as a, as our printer. I got him as our printer, as, in our, as our shirt supplier. And then he expressed interest in becoming uh, partners for the shirts. So that one happened in March 2013, if I'm not mistaken. So we had like a 50-50 partnership. And then after about like a year and a half of working together, it was a really good working relationship. So... We brought him in, and he's now part of zero three two and in in the whole thing, not just the t shirts for the most part, he's the one uh responsible for printing, coming up with designs, and then uh all of the zero three two merchandise and then I'm really just the one trying to market it, trying to sell it. but even after we did that i mean it was it was fun, it was super fun, and it was making some money, but it wasn't really. It wasn't, you know, it was like a nice little side thing to do. And then I think at that point, let me double check, but I think at that point I started paying myself a salary, which wasn't much. I think, wait, no, let me just double check. I think I started paying myself in 2014. Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm looking at my records and then I think I only started paying myself in... January 2015. And even then, when I say paying myself, it really wasn't anything. I think it was like 2,000 pesos. We were paying, I was paying myself and Jake and, and then uh, Karen, my assistant. We were the only and still are the only employees of 032. But uh, fortunately, we pay a little, we pay ourselves a little bit more now. But yeah, we only started paying ourselves in 2015, and only really 2,000 pesos. Ah, no, 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 yeah, sorry, about 4,000 pesos. Yeah, so we only started paying ourselves in 2015, and about two to 4,000 pesos only. And then we were doing the clothing, we were still doing the clothing, but it didn't really become a real business until we started doing client work, which is still our main source of revenue. When I mean client work is like basically we offer a service that we offer a service to companies if they want consistent social media content, that's what we give them. Basically it's captions and photos. And then that's it. We don't do video work. We don't do branding. It's just social media content. And then once we started doing that, it kind of snowballed and we got a bunch of clients. Yeah, we and we only did that in 2016. 
So it's really only been 16, 17, 18. So it's really only been about three, three well, early 2016. That's when we started doing the client work. So it's really only been about three years since 032 became like a real honest-to-goodness business and paying us decent salaries. Before that, we were, you know, like a boat lost at sea. We were just finding our way through. Fortunately, at least for me, like I had other things going, but, it, I, you know, I wasn't really enjoying what I was doing with the other stuff. And then only now that uh, since we started doing client work, that I could have really that I've really been able to focus on zero three two. If you think about it, if we if we started in two thousand eleven, and then it took us it took it took us about two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve, two thousand thirteen to figure out that we could sell clothing, and clothing is still a big part of our uh, of our business of our revenue, but it's only about like twenty to thirty percent. So from 2013 to 2016, we were doing that. And then only 2016 that we d- decided to do client work. And then that's when it became a, a much bigger business for us. Let's say 2016. So uh, that's five years of figuring it out, right? So not necessarily, it didn't take necessarily five years to be profitable because really, honestly, we were profitable since the beginning because no one was getting paid. There was no overhead. And you can, and then actually, that's the nice thing with the internet right now. There are so many possible businesses that that can happen with the internet and you don't need to put the money in. The thing is, I think a lot of people... Look at it like they're freelancing. But if you if they treat themselves like a business, then they have the opportunity to grow much bigger, I feel. Like instead of instead of getting a hundred percent of your freelance money and then that's your salary, don't think of it that way. Think of it as that's the revenue in your company and you have expenses and then you have overhead. Your overhead could be the rent you pay, the food you eat, and then so it's it's about being systematic and it's about knowing what you do. So let's go back. Oops, let's go back to the book Profit First. Profit First taught me how to manage all of the all of the ins and outs of uh, the cash flow of the business. I, I I always have difficulty explaining this in audio format. So honestly. You should just go get the book, uh, Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. I, I'm blanking on his name again, but it's in the show notes. So the concept of Profit First is that you should, your exp- um, oh, here we go. I, I don't really want to explain it. So, but the concept of Profit First is you have to, tr- you have to think of your businesses in a different way. Usually when, when we think of business, it, so it's revenue minus expenses equals profit. So profit is the end thing. But the the way uh, the book uh, frames it is that it should be it should be revenue minus profit equals expenses. Now it's the same, but there's a mind there's a mindset change there. It's take the profit out first and then look at expenses so even if you only get like 1 or 2% of profit from your business that means you're still profitable as long as your revenue can pay off all your expenses so the idea is instead of putting more money into a business and trying to grow the revenue it, you allow the revenue to dictate how big the business should be Obviously, there's going to be people who will disagree with this with this concept. Now, like companies like Facebook, Amazon, Google wouldn't have been made if they followed this concept. They're playing a totally different game. But most of us who own like small, medium enterprises, little businesses, a coffee shop, that might be the smarter way to approach your business instead of always putting money in 
to a business, you can make the business dictate how big it should be. I, I hope I'm making sense. I'm not really sure if I if I it's it's difficult to to summarize a book into a few sentences, but that's basically the concept. And I ever ever since we followed the profit first principles, it's helped our business immensely. And and has honestly taken a lot of stress away from running the business. Um, I hope that answered the question. Let me just double check on the question. I want to find out how long it took between the inception of the company to consistently making a profit. Yeah, I think I think that answers the question. Yeah, so we started 2011, basically sort of made a profit right away because we didn't really put any capital in it. But it took us until 2013 to have recurring real revenue because that was when we decided to go full on the clothing and it took us until 2016 before it became a big part of uh, my professional life and that's when we started offering client work and in 2018 we started this podcast okay so thank you for listening to the second ask me anything episode maybe i'll do another one in the future and honestly these are really difficult episodes for me to do because i don't i'm not used to just talking by myself like i really prefer having someone in front of me and then asking questions and then just having a nice conversation but this might be a good change and then uh, i want to see what happens and i want to see what uh we can do with this format. Thank you to our sponsors, destination specialists. Thank you to the Patreons. Thank you for, to the people who share this podcast. Uh, the music from this podcast is Piano March by Audionautics. If you haven't yet, subscribe. I'll see you next Tuesday. Yeah.